Hi, hi, welcome, welcome. Okay, so from childhood abuse to domestic abuse, from meeting her biological father in her 20s to living on her own for the first time at the age of 31, fear was so engraved in Webby, Wendy Babcock <laughs> that she didn't even realize it had taken over her life. Fear decided every move she had made. Fear had held her in a toxic, controlling, abusive marriage for 13 and a half years. Fear convinced her no one would believe in her, that she was alone, and fear repeatedly proved to her she wasn't safe in her own comfort zone. She let depression creep into her life, which held her back from living her true passions and lifelong dreams. Almost 13 years later, after leaving her abusive marriage, enduring a difficult recovery from 12-hour double lateral mastectomy and losing her father to cancer, Wendy decided fear was no longer welcome in her life. She made up her mind to stop living paycheck to paycheck, and she quit her 20-year career to become a motivational speaker. Wendy was trained by the number one best-selling author and world-renowned speaker, Will Bowen, as one of seven worldwide complaint-free world speakers, where she learned how to take the stage with humor and passion to impact all aspects of audiences' lives. But that was just the tip of the iceberg. Today, Wendy gets to ignite audiences to conquer their fears and finally live the life they deserve with her seven-week program, Warrior Unchained, From Fear to Focus. Wendy believes that it was the small daily steps she took to find her inner warrior that finally set her free. And she has set an unwavering intention to teach women everywhere that they can live without being held back by fear too. Wendy, you know I'm excited to see you, woman. <laughs> I'm so glad to have you on. Thank you so much for your time and welcome to the Live Fearlessly vlog. How are you doing today? I'm excited too. <laughs> <laughs> I've been looking forward to being on this with you. So and I watched the other ones were, were phenomenal. So I'm excited. Yes. Thank you so much for taking the time to be with us today and share more about your story. And um, I love to start with interesting facts about each of the, the guests to, to get to know you more and um, tell a little insiders uh, to the guests uh, listening in. So tell us something interesting about your life that we would just not know about you otherwise. Oh, wow. Well, I guess um, a lot of people don't realize I'm actually a, um, an award-winning lyricist. <laughs> so That's awesome. I write, yeah, I write song lyrics. Um, I have a co-writer that lives in uh, Sedona, Arizona, and we have over 90 songs we've written together. And what? Got, yeah. And so we, we haven't pursued it in a long time, but for a while there, like we were sending stuff down to Nashville. We had like major artists looking at our stuff and we were like this close to getting on um, Gretchen Wilson's last album. So frequently, <laughs> that's so fun. Yeah, and then I was the um, January round wound January round winner for the country cat category of the VH1 Song of the Year contest. What? That's <laughs> awesome. What, yeah. How long ago was that? That was in two thousand six. Cool. Yeah. That's <laughs> Ninety <laughs> different songs, though. That's amazing, and you don't even do that, like. On a regular thing but 90 songs just sounds like so much for someone that that isn't like what you always work on I don't know yeah you and always it, got something amazing going I love it <laughs> well it's funny because I look at the things from years ago that I wrote they were very dark very like sad sappy lyrics and then I went through a period where I couldn't write because I was learning to be happy and I'm like how do you write when you're happy <laughs> yeah you no know? and then I, I kind of transformed into being able to write songs that are positive and uplifting. So it's like this whole journey I went on with that aspect of my life. That's so fun. I love that. And I mean, it gets a lot of emotion out on paper mm -hmm. and um, yeah, that's really cool. Did you, did you like having a co-person do it? Like you wrote the songs together or you did the lyrics, they did the, the beats or... Yep. I just do the, I don't know how to do like the musical side of it. Like okay, I don't cool. have that gene. So I could just write the lyrics and uh, Kenny Starr is his name. Him and I just meshed. He could read my lyrics and within an hour, he would have a melody for me to listen to. 
the man is just a genius. That's amazing. <laughs> so, yeah. So we just work really well together and I'll say, well, hey, this is kind of what I'm hearing. If it's slow, whatever tempo or, you know, this song is what inspired me. And then he would just do the music. That's so fun. I love yeah. that. I knew, I knew a little bit about that, but not like the contest <laughs> and all of that extra stuff. So that's super fun. Yeah. <laughs> well, congratulations on being so artistic. I love it. <laughs> Thank um, you. Or creative. Uh, yeah, maybe our creative. Yeah. Um, so let's talk about fear. Okay. Um, so when fear holds you down and, um, you know, you're going through transitions and everything, how are you mentally feeling? Um, how are you in that mental state when you think about fear and uh, yourself with fear? It's very debilitating for me. Like when I have that fear, it affects me physically. I get a knot in my stomach. You know, I just feel like I can't function outside of that fear, um, daily yeah. things become a bigger chore. It's almost like I, depends on what the fear is, obviously, but right, just strap me right down and make me like shut off contact to the outside world that's going on outside of my brain. Yeah. So it can be very debilitating. Yeah. It's, it's like you're <laughs> paralyzed in your own life and yep. figuring out where to go with bigger, small things is definitely... And, and you get that, and you change your mind from focusing on that problem that's holding you down to to switch gears to be solution oriented because that's how I kind of come out of it a little bit. Yeah. Yeah. I love that. Yeah, <laughs> that's so true. So let's talk about um, fear specifically for you. So we're going to talk about your story a little bit more, and we're gonna. Okay, so let's talk. Do you want to talk about your? What avenue do you want to take us on for talking specifically about fear that you've had? Okay. Well, I guess I would go back to, and kind of like, um, go kind of chronologically. I would go back to my prior marriage and, and how I lived in fear within that, even when, yeah. even where things were going well, because obviously when you're in a situation like that, it's not hundred percent violence all the time. That's not how that works. At least not for me, it wasn't. Right. Um, but you live in that daily fear, wondering when the next thing is going to be that's going to upset him or when he gives me that look I know okay I did something wrong in my mind I did something wrong that he's upset with me about now and it was just constant fear yeah non-stop every day and not knowing what the next big explosion was going to be right yeah. and that was 13 and a half years as your bio yeah. said you know that you <laughs> went back and forth of having the fear of you know, leaving or not. So um, right. let's talk about like how it, it came to a stop a little bit. So okay. when you're breaking free of, you know, the fear that you had back and forth leaving, I mean, was there times that you thought about leaving before it actually was a reality? Oh yeah. And I had, I had left. I mean, actually at a time when things were a lot worse, um, I had left and I went back and people are always like, you know, why did you go back? But they don't understand that mentality. You know, I had never lived on my own at that point. You know, we got married when I was 18 years old. You know, so I had never even had my own apartment, none of that. And we had two children, a mortgage and bills. And it's, it's a comfort zone. Even though it's a terrible yeah. comfort zone, it's a comfort zone you live in of fear, basically. And anything right. outside that comfort zone is very scary. It brings on more fear, more doubt. So I have all these things, like kind of all the balls up in the air sort of thing with the mortgage, the kids, where am I going to go? That's always the biggest question. Right. I don't have extra money for myself. How am I going to support my kids when I leave him? So there's all these questions that you have. And so when it got down to um, actually leaving, um, it was kind of two things as to where my, my mindset finally evolved to. Yeah. Um, I didn't realize at the time. Um, one of it was, I remembered my sister, um, just kind of giving me a look one time. I was complaining about my situation a bit, you know, cause you do my, I was close with her, you know, and you just see that look on your family's face. It's like, just leave already. Why won't you leave? Right. And I remember thinking, I'm just not going to talk about it anymore until I'm ready to go. Cause I can see they want me to go. I'm not ready. It just, it was really hard. And so I kind of quit talking about it. Um, and I've learned through the complaint-free world that I've been trained in, when you stop talking about negative things, it leaves room to start your having different thoughts. And so I think what that did was 
um, help me develop more positive thoughts. Yeah. So it's kind of a little bit, it, it took a while, of course, because right. and the reason why I came to that conclusion is after I left him, my sister said to me, <coughs> she's Wendy, I'm surprised you left. And I went home to coffee, <clears throat> I'm gonna choke. <laughs> mm. She said, I'm surprised you left. And I said, Tina, you know what I was going through. And she's like, but you haven't complained about it or talked about it in months. I thought things were getting better. And so I kind of had that aha moment. Like yeah. all of these two things are, are somehow related, you know? So, and the other thing I think it was, is I gave myself no other choice but to leave. I remember having a big explosion fight, you know, and just in that moment thinking, I have to leave. And I have to <clears throat> not allow myself any other options. Because yeah. what happened was before that, in wanting to leave, you're thinking, I have nowhere to go. I have no money. But when you don't give yourself any other options, suddenly it was like I had this aha moment. My mom had a house for sale. It was empty. It had been like that for over a year. It never oh, dawned on me to call her up. Hey, mom, I'm finally leaving him. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. So that was my out. But it wasn't until I said, this, I made up my mind. There's no other options. Leaving is the only option. Yeah. So, making that deci the decision in, in anything, you know, it's, yeah. it just starts with making the decision for yourself and just. Yeah. And then the, things show the up. Final say, right? Like you are the only person that can decide that in anything. Yeah. It's but, very true. Uh, yeah. And then things start showing up to make that everything work. It just, yeah. it's crazy how everything lined up for me after that moment. Yeah, it's, it's very true. Like if you don't take the first step forward, the rest of it can never fall into place, whatever yeah, it that, is. Yeah. And that first step is so scary and you don't, you don't think beyond that first step that you just debilitate yourself so bad where if you would just take a deep breath and just take that step, it's like, wow, this whole new world kind of opens up beyond that fear. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, for sure. So, okay. So breaking free of the fear and moving into, you know, doing what you needed to do for you and your, your family. Um, yeah. we always go into new directions and new relationships form, fall apart, those kinds of things. So tell us a little bit more about the relationships that you had, um, during that time of the, like going through with the abuse and then leaving like any of that transition, let's talk about, um, relationships and how they kind of changed or shift, um, with support around you, that kind of thing. Right. And it's fascinating looking back at what relationships I did have, because obviously when you're in a relationship, like I he was very controlling, um, right. very manipulative, jealous. So I didn't have a lot of like outside friends really. Yeah. So it was mostly like, you know, his friends, his wives that I was friends with. And what I found was the women that I kind of attracted into my life at the time were women who were in similar situations. Mm. So we would get together and basically have bitch sessions about what we were going through. Yeah. And so, you know, you're all in these toxic situations and you're talking about it, you're talking about it, you're t but you're not acting on it. So then when I left, those relationships just kind of fall away. Sure because I was a threat in a way <laughs> to their realities then, you know, like, yep. Oh, you know, what is she doing? She's getting crazy. She went and left, <laughs> you know? <laughs> yeah. So, so yeah, I, I felt like I was alone for quite a while after I left. I mean, family was there, of course, family. I mean, for me, that's how my family's built. So, I mean, not everyone's that fortunate. So I had my parents and my sister, right. you know, in support of me, which was fantastic. Um, but right. friend wise, I just felt like I was alone you know, and it wasn't yeah. until I started, um, well, personal development, as you know, is huge. I mean, when I learned about personal development books and laws of attraction, actually my co-writer Kenny is the one who introduced me to all that. <laughs> I had no awesome. idea. Yeah. And so that's kind of was my uphill climb then getting out of that whole toxic area of my life. I love that. Yeah. People don't realize that those little details oh, yeah. when you start your story, like, that those are actually, they come through the whole time. Yeah, it's huge. Like if you had not been a lyricist and met this person yeah. and worked with them, then who knows how long it would have taken you to look into personal development and, and oh, yeah. climb out of the hole that, you know, you were living in and fear 
Oh yeah, absolutely. It was the catalyst, obviously, you know, I mean, once you learn that little piece of information and it's a huge topic, but the little piece of information you didn't right. have prior that just, wow. It's like, you're almost awakened. Like, yeah. Oh my God. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Awesome. <laughs> That's so cool to hear though. Like that. I love that little, the little tidbits that come through like that, that just mean yeah. you don't realize how big the tiny moments are until you can look back and be like, wow, if I, that didn't happen, if that didn't happen, like I wouldn't be here right now, or it would just look very, very differently. Exactly. And that's that whole mind shift again, where, you know, before I was talking about all the negatives, the toxics, everything I didn't want. But yeah. then you realize, oh my gosh, I have to start talking about what I do want in my life. I have to talk about yep. these, what they've happened. And once you start doing that and actually thinking about for the first time for most people, what do I want? Most people don't ask themselves that question. They're too busy, you know, being a mom, being a wife, being a friend, everybody else. They don't say, what about me? Mm -hmm. and what, once I did that, once I'm like, okay, because it feels selfish at first. And most women will tell you that when we ask ourselves, well, what do I want out of life? It feels like, oh my gosh, am I a bad person? You know, right. I'm not. And so once yeah. I did that, yeah, things really started to evolve and kind of like <laughs> went really quickly into bigger, better things. Yeah. Right. Absolutely. So, I mean, we, we, we pretty much know, I would ask like, what, what, what compelled you to jump ship from leaving? And you already mentioned that a little bit, you know, you had a big fight and you really just made the decision to start thinking about the fact that there was no other choice. Um, did you want to touch on that anymore about, you know, really the decision making of going from having the fear to just deciding like you won't have it in your life any further. Right. And you know, it's funny because before I learned about the laws of attraction we were talking about, yeah. um, when, when I was going through that process of knowing I was going to be leaving, because there is a mindset where you're like, okay, th this is it. You just know when you walk out that door that you are not going back. There's, there's no wavering. I can't explain it. Something just clicks. But prior to that, in, in getting that mindset set up, I remember seeing, this is the silliest thing, by the way, but if you're familiar with Love is Attraction, you'll get it. So there was this, these apartment com complexes in Ma where I live in Austin, right? And they always looked so nice. And I would just always kind of daydream about, oh my gosh, wouldn't it be great if I could just take my girls and I could go live there and it looks so nice. And I'd have this kind of fairy tale life. It'd be wonderful. And there's the crazy thing. A year after I left him, I moved into those apartments. <laughs> yeah. So manifesting, baby. Yeah. So there's that another mindset thing where I was thinking about something, a possibility that I never thought would be my reality. So just that little bit of mindset, that little bit of daydreaming kind of catapulted it into my reality. It was kind of crazy. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. So <clears throat> I would love for you to tell any advice maybe that you have about leaving fear behind um, and, you know, anything, anything you want to say about overcoming fear. And then I want to touch about uh, the other aspect of your story for sure. Um, for me, mainly, I think what it is, is that personal development aspect of it before you can really tackle fear um, to me is working on those small daily things you can do for yourself, you know, yeah. self care, putting yourself first, thinking about those future things you'd like to see. And it's kind of those baby steps because until you have a good foundation of all of that, it's really hard to make those leaps and, you know, over those big hurdles of fear. So if you have yeah. a good base of who you are and where you want to go, that fear doesn't, it's not a huge wall. Now it's just like a, maybe a little, a little gate you got to climb over. <laughs> Yeah. And there might be a door to that gate. Right. Exactly. <laughs> I love that. So, um, do you, do you have any like tips for people about the little daily things that you maybe did that could be helpful? Or is there anything like a baby step yeah. that you would tell people to maybe take? Yeah. And actually it's part of my program, the warrior on chain. So I use the acronym focus. So I'll give you the F, which is the biggest one. Um, find your freaking jam. Ooh. <laughs> Music because music is so important. People don't realize the effects it has on your brain. It actually increases the dopamine in your brain, which is that There's feel the good. again. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So music, it, believe it or not, if you find your jam, you put it on first thing in the morning, we're talking like a get up and dance. This is my jam song. Yeah. Right? Not your spread on your toast kind of jam. 
Yeah, not kind of like, oh, da, 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 da. you know, it's, it's, you, you can't help but move, right? Yeah. So you put that on first thing in the morning, and immediately that starts those feel-good hormones going, that dopamine in your brain, and you'll notice that things won't frustrate you as much through the day. You'll feel a little less stress, and there's all kinds of science behind it. You can just Google it of, you know, how, how fascinating, how much music actually helps your brain and elevates your mood. Yeah. So. I love that. I'm a huge yeah. music lover. So yeah, <laughs> cool. that's a great tip. I love it. Um, okay. So let's, let's talk a little bit about um, the fact that you had a 12 hour <laughs> bilateral double mastectomies. Yep. Um, that <laughs> is another huge thing that you have overcome with fear. I mean, oh yeah, that wasn't during your first marriage, was it? No, mm, no, this was um, actually just so two, after this big hurdle. Now you had yes. this. So <laughs> go ahead and tell us whatever you would like to share about that. Okay, so two years ago, um, I went for my, or two and a half years ago now, I went for my first mammogram, you know, and you know, you're nervous, all that kind of stuff, you know, but I'm like, in my family, that you know, for sure. Oh, yeah. Well, in my, my dad's side, so my paternal side has a very, long history of breast cancer in females yeah. in my family under age 50, which is, increases your risk. Um, and so um, my cousin, who's two years younger than me, had just been diagnosed with um, um, DCIS. So it's like okay. a stage zero breast cancer. And so I'm like, I'm getting my mammogram, that's it. So I went and had that done. And of course I get the call back, which, ugh, more fear. Even though I worked at a hospital, I know a lot of times the callback is just, to, you know, there was a spot they looked at. Generally, it's a false alarm. You know, right. I don't know the statistics, but usually it's a false alarm. Right. And so they're like, let's have you come back in, do another mammogram and ultrasound. So I did. And as I'm waiting, the tech comes back in with the radiologist, who I know, of course, because I worked at the hospital. And so he says to me, he's like, I have to tell you, he's like, you have so many micro calcifications I can't even count them and on both sides <laughs> so you're like what you know you just kind of hold your breath and you're like you say I want you to go have some biopsies um so he set that all up I can, this is the craziest part UW Madison calls me um they're like okay so we had you set up for five biopsies like five they're like yeah we've never done this before that many biopsies and I'm like it doesn't still fear into telling you I'm a unicorn yeah. So I'm like, you're kidding me, right? They're like, no, we've never done that many on one person at a time. And so when I went in, they're like, look, all of our radiologist team we met, we decided it's not a good idea to do five at one time besides cost and pain and just, it's a lot. So like, we're going to do one and we'll see where that goes. Then we'll, we'll proceed from there. So I got the one biopsy done. Nine. We were really happy. Everything's great. But they're like, look, you need to go have genetic testing. Before we do any more biopsies, go get your genetic testing done and then we'll talk. So I did that and I looked into my family history. My cousin who had been diagnosed was BRCA positive. So your BRCA gene, if you, it's a mutation I should say of your gene. Okay. Basically meaning you have two BRCA genes um, and if they're shut off or they're mutated, it can't fight against breast cancer in your body. That's what those genes mean. So say so you have even more chance of having right, breast cancer. Increase because you, your body doesn't fight it off then. Um, and so she was BRCA2 positive. So she was so sweet. She sent me her um, DNA report so I could send that on to my genetic counselors. And sure enough, I was BRCA2 positive as well. So what that so meant- You don't it, have the gene that can fight against breast cancer. Exactly, okay. exactly. So, and due to my extreme family history, all five of my dad's cousins either had breast cancer or were just diagnosed in the, you know, so- it, it long, long story. And I, my aunt had passed away from breast cancer, just a long line of, of, um, yeah. So I made the decision after talking to my surgeon and stuff that I was going to do a prophylactic bilateral mastectomy. But so a lot of people don't realize they think automatically implants, you know, you have them either you go flat, you have implants. Um, but I did a lot of research and I found that there was ways that you could have reconstruction without being implants. And my concern was many women who have the implants, you have to have what's called an expander. So what they do is they like, if this is your chest and your chest muscle, they put this expander between and so it expands that muscle. Okay. Which is very, can be very painful during the process that you have to keep going back each week to get it expanded. 
Oh. You go back for a second surgery and then they, they, they put in the implant. Okay. And so a coworker of mine went through that. I'm like, I am not going through all that. I don't want a second surgery. I don't want to have to have them replaced in 10 years. They say your chest wall can get really cold because of the implants aren't your tissue. Um, and so I came upon, um, excuse me, a Facebook page for women who had mastectomies that had had um, deep flap reconstruction. And what this is, is they actually use your own tissue of your belly. So okay. they actually, yeah, they actually cut a section of your belly, like a football shape, and use that and reconnect all the tissue, use your own tissue to, to recreate your breasts. So it's a longer surgery, but it's only one surgery. Wow. It's my, it's my own tissue, so it'll, it'll gain weight and lose weight as I do. Um, it'll be warm and cold as I'm warm and cold. Um, so I just thought that was the best option for me. And again, everyone yeah. is going to find the option that's best for them, but this is what I wanted to have done. So that's why it was 12 hours. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's well, that's, yeah. that's really awesome that you, you know, didn't just do what they recommended. You know, you did what was, what you felt you needed to do <clears throat> and what you were comfortable doing. Right. And you have to be your own advocate. And I tell women that all the time, be your own advocate, no matter what that surgeon's telling you, you have to do, you have to do your own research, find a group of women who have undergone this, get their advice, their tips. It helps yeah. relieve the tension or the, not tension, the, um, the fear too. Right. By talking well, to women and it's, yourself. Yeah, absolutely. You know, the more educated you are on something very serious about your own body, right. like the more you will feel comfortable, you know, making those decisions or asking the right questions to, to figure it out. When you want to know a silly little tidbit too that I did. So again, music <laughs> is a great yeah. base for everything. I actually found a site that talked about how music could actually help you heal from surgery. They say by listening to music while you're under anesthesia, it actually helps promote healing, faster healing. I thought, well, it can't hurt. So right. I went out and I bought some, um, it's not even wireless. Everything's contained in this headset. So it's kind of like, it's got the little button. You upload your music right into it. Oh yeah. Talk to my surgeon. She's like, absolutely. So I got in there. They put the headphones on me and she actually updated my daughter like halfway through. She's like, well, your mom's doing great. Listening away to her music. And <laughs> That's and awesome. So here's the crazy part. So during my healing, I was in the hospital for five days. Uh, my plastic surgeon came in and he's like, you, your body is healing at an unusual rate. He's like, you are healing so fast. He's like, it's bizarre. I'm like, ah, listen to my music. It's music. It's work. <laughs> it was my jam. It was my jams, my freaking jams. I love it. <laughs> that is so cool. I love that. I'm going to remember that if I ever need yeah. surgery. <clears throat> yeah. <laughs> um, so I mean, okay, so let's talk about your recovery a little bit more. Okay. Um so yeah, you had a fast recovery. Like tell us a little bit more about your recovery and um like how you felt about yourself, like any fears that you might have had, you know, that's a big adjustment. Oh yeah. Um, and and removing the fear of, you know, having breast cancer and then transitioning into really getting used to your your body the way it is now. So Go ahead and touch on that a little bit more. It's, it's funny because I did not foresee myself having an issue with that after surgery. Honestly, I body thought, image. I, I really didn't. I just, cause I didn't, yeah. didn't really have a problem with my body. I mean, I was a little overweight, whatever, but I didn't like, I don't know, obsessed about it. I guess. I don't know. Yeah. But, so to look in the mirror and see from the neck down a different person, it took me off guard because yeah. <clears throat> People don't understand a mastectomy is not like having breast augmentation. It looks right. nothing like it. I had no nipples. People don't realize that usually you lose your nipples. So yeah. basically it was like having a Barbie doll. Yep. Mine was bruised up so terrible. They were basically purple. Um, and then having these scars. So I had the circle scar and then lines coming off of the circle. And then my abdomen, I was cut from hip to hip. Okay. Cause that's where they, they took all that tissue. So there's a scar all the way across. And then I got what they call dog ears. So basically it's like a, a pouch back behind where, where the incision stops, of course, because they had sewed these two things, pieces of me together. It created like a puffed out section <laughs> more than it was. Um, so I did, I did have um, corrective surgery on that afterwards, you know, because they okay. can't do that kind of stuff. But, but it, I almost felt myself slipping into depression 
And I think it was because I was so upset that I was upset about it, as silly as that sounds. Mm. And I kept telling my well, husband. You prepared. And I wasn't. I did not prepare myself. I read stories about it. Women told me, you know, they weren't prepared, but I'm like, that's not going to be me. I know what I'm getting into. I know what to expect. I've seen all the pictures. I got you this. researched it. Yeah. <laughs> I did all my research. I'm like, I got this. Right. And then my you get huge. Yeah. And then you get home and you see yourself in the mirror and it's like, wow, who the hell is that? <laughs> and it's, it's just this whole adjustment period that I had to go through. Yeah. And it was hard. It was so hard. I didn't feel like me and my own skin. And even once I recovered, you know, and you're able to be intimate again and stuff, yeah. I just did not feel like me, like I was attractive anymore. You know, it didn't matter how much my husband had reassured me. It didn't matter. Right. You know, it's he's what like, you no. believe about yourself. Yeah. It's what you believe about yourself. And I'm like, I just don't feel sexy. I don't feel. And it was the hardest thing to explain. You know, some people yeah. just looked at me like, oh, okay, whatever, you know, get over yourself. Right. <laughs> but I'm like, this right. is what I'm going through. So, and yes. then a friend of mine posted about this boudoir session, someone who had tattoos. And I thought <laughs> maybe that's what I should do. You might yeah. Rebecca Plouts. I don't know if you know her or not. <laughs> So, so I answered her model call and of course you selected me and I wasn't sure what to expect. Honestly, I'm like, am I going to feel like, you know, is this going to be weird? Cause you and I knew each other, of course. I'm like, right. it's gonna be weird, you know, for me, you to see me and, you know, <laughs> so, <clears throat> but I'll tell you what, that was like a life changing. I'm like, I choked up. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> You don't do it. You know what happens I when you do not doing it. So, but that was life-changing for me, honestly. That was huge because seeing myself in those pictures, like, there I am. That's basically what I thought. There, there I am. You helped me see what my husband saw. So that was huge. Sorry. I, and I was trying so hard not to get choked up. <laughs> yep. I got through everything um, else, but that part was huge. Yeah. So, I mean, so just to touch on it a little bit, like seeing yourself in a whole new way, I mean, that was oh, something yeah. that you absolutely needed. Oh yeah. For like mental recovery of something so right. drastic that changed with your own body. Right. And, and people who don't get it, don't get it. So I talked about it very openly on my Facebook and I had one girl actually comment on there kind of bashing me about it. She's like, well, I don't see what being in your underwear for strangers, how that makes you feel good. I'm like it wasn't for strangers. Right. You know, I said it was for my husband, for myself, mostly for myself even. Of course, you know, my husband enjoyed the pictures, but it was more for me. And I said, until you go through something like what I went through and you don't recognize yourself anymore, and then you can actually see yourself through other people's eyes, it, it was life-changing. It really was. So, I mean, like I said, people... I unmuted. There you're back. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> but yeah, so um, yeah. And that was another thing too. Same as after the surgery, I didn't expect to feel that way. After the session I had with you, I didn't yeah. know I was going to feel that good about everything. So it was fantastic. <laughs> well, and that all ties together too. So just to bring around the story too, like the yeah. same week, right? Tell, tell everyone the same week that I had this out and you were selected for that. Isn't that the same week that you were in the process of doing the Will Bowen thing? Yes. Because I remember you coming to talk with me <laughs> the day of your session, how excited you were and telling me about this application that you put in. Like yes, that was that, all happening at the same time. It, it, you know, and I actually forgot about that, but that is absolutely right because Again, personal development. I was listening to an audible by Pam Grout and she just talked about 21 day complaint free challenge by Will yeah. Bowen, the complaint free yep, world. I remember you telling me this. Yeah. And I think it was, if I go back, I believe it was January 16th. And I, that day I went on his Facebook to figure out who this guy was, see if he was legit or whatever. And that's the day he posted. He's like, Hey, I'm looking for 10 people who I can train and certify to talk about a complaint free world. And I went, Oh. I would love to do that. Like, I'm not a speaker though. I'm like, I worked in a hospital for 20 years. I'm like, I don't know why you, I want to become a yes girl. You're yes. like, uh, wait, I want to do that. Yes. Yeah. And so that's why, and I'm like, I'm just going to apply. So I did. And by some miracle out of thousands of people from around the world, 
they chose me. And then, you know, then you had your session I was chosen for. I'm like, it's crazy how that mindset, you jump in and stuff starts lining up. Well, and that's the thing I've always been told, you know, like money doesn't lead. It follows. If you, if you right. put your first step forward, that's when, like we said before, everything just kind of starts oh, yeah. to line up with what your goals and what you want. And it's really like when you put into the universe, like the universe will start to meet you where oh, you yeah. need. And it's crazy because like I had thought about being a speaker probably a couple of years prior just yeah. from learning about personal development and laws. And I thought, oh gosh, I would love to talk about this, but it's such a broad topic. I don't know where I would hone in at and what would be my subject. And then this popped in. I'm like, this is brilliant because yeah. getting rid of negatives in your life is huge. And what's more negative than complaining that we do. So I'm like, I just really gravitated towards Will's message. Yeah. And I'm like, this, this is it. This is, this is my sign. And an amazing <laughs> opportunity. You were one out of seven. Yeah. I'm one of seven in the world now that's trained and certified to speak on behalf of a complaint free world. And it, here's the crazy thing. So when I got on the trainings, I felt like I was the low man on the totem pole. Like I didn't have any experience. You know, right. I thought I'm really gonna have to really work at this to, to kind of be at everyone else's level. Cause these guys, everyone else was so impressive. Cool. Um, I finished the training and I just quit my job to pursue this. And then Will called me one day and he's like, Hey, I would love to name you as the director of our complaint free trainers program. Are you in? Hell yeah, man. <laughs> That's so cool. Yeah. And you know what? That also brings an interesting like fact that I've always been told too is like you never want to be the smartest person in the room. No. You you it's good not to be the smartest person in the room. <laughs> right. You were definitely at an advantage because you got to learn from not only Will Bowen, but like how everyone else was showing up. You got to see oh, what yeah. that looks like from around the world or from the U.S. And yeah, around the world, world? Yeah, yeah. Cause, um, we have one gal, Claudia, who's actually, um, she was in Romania. She's in Dubai now. We have Carlos in Mexico. We've got Lara in Seattle. We've got someone in Connecticut. So yeah, they're, we're all over. That's awesome. I'm so <laughs> proud of you. That's so cool. Thank you. <laughs> um, so, so yeah, all of that, like just goes together you know like it's just yeah. how everything has worked out to like bring you to having your own space and helping other people with um your right. program or warrior unchained and like all of that amazing stuff so you know you've gotten really good over the last years of moving through fear really well and just turning it into really something positive to transform your life even more and get you to mm -hmm. Fulfilling, fulfilling those lifelong dreams that you mentioned. Um, yeah. So thinking five years from now, where do you see yourself? What oh, gosh. do you see yourself in? <laughs> <laughs> right. Well, I think in five years, well, because I'm planning my first event in May, of course, that Rebecca's speaking at, of, of course. So I'm excited for that. You get a whole hour to show your stuff. Um, in five years, I want to have this be a huge, huge conference in Wisconsin. I want this to be something women really look forward to coming to, you know, so I kind of want to become like that household name, you know, especially in Wisconsin, if I can branch out great, but it's just kind of taking those steps and kind of seeing it as a, it's so much bigger than what it is now. And that's what I'm kind of focusing on is saying, you know, this is the first event, but it, this isn't my focus. My focus has on growing this event and, you know, and touching as many lives as I possibly can, you know, and teaching yeah. people like you do about fear and, starting with those basics and baby steps. Yeah. I love yeah. that. So, so, um, warrior unchained live is what the event yep. is called. Right. And, yep. um, mother's day weekend, right? Yep. May and it's all well. weekend. So why don't you just quickly go ahead and tell people like a little bit about that? Because if they're okay. actually, let's save that, let's save that for our Facebook live so they can come check it out before okay, then. Perfect. Yeah. Um, but okay. So where can people connect with you? We'll just start with that. Where can they connect with you? Cause then they can find yeah. out about it on their own. Yeah. Well, um, Facebook, of course, um, yeah. just Wendy Babcock and you'll, you'll see my face in the profile picture. <laughs> um, otherwise my website, wendybabcock.com. Um, email is just info at wendybabcock.com. <laughs> so if you search me, you'll find me. Awesome. Yeah. Cool. Okay, so is there anything, one last thing you would like to leave the viewers with um, for the vlog? 
Yes. Um, no matter where you're at today, if you're able to dream bigger than you've even imagined. So if you start with a vision and say, I want to make a thousand dollars a month, triple quadruple that as much as you can make it so that it's scary. Make it so that dream is so scary because I'll tell you what, back in 2006, when I left that abusive marriage, I would never, never have pictured myself being able to travel and get paid for it to motivate other women and inspire other women. Um, so this yeah. has been a dream I couldn't even, even imagine for myself, you know, but it's all that process of, like you said, where are you going to be in five years and think about something, but then make it even bigger, so big that it scares you. So, and that'll just catapult you towards that. I love it. And yeah, exactly. Making the steps to go towards even that one big, scary yeah. thing will put into your path way more amazing things than you don't see. You, you see point A to point Z maybe, but right. it's all in between where those tiny moments, like everything we just talked about, yeah. They build you into the person that you are and the, the people that you'll help and you meet them along the way. It's every single person and all of the experiences that you have throughout, it, it all matters. It's all intertwined. It's all part of your roadmap. So yeah. I love and, and, and being open. When you see a positive opportunity, you have to jump at it. You have yep. to say, you know what, this is good. And um, I'm just going to jump in, you know. Yeah, absolutely. hundred percent. Well, I want to say thank you again, Wendy, for your time. You are just a doll to hear all about. And um, guys, you need to connect with Wendy. You need to come see one of these events. So depending on what time you're watching this, um, maybe it's years from now and hey, yeah. you missed the warrior first one, but you better be at the next one that she hosts. Right. So um, thank you so much for watching and remember, love yourself and live fearlessly. Thanks guys. Thank you.